Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bobby an alcoholic. My home group is the underground group. We meet at the Old Pine Community Center, 4th of Lombard in Philadelphia, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 8 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. We'd love to have you. My sobriety date is June 2nd, 1988. And Chapter 5 of the Big Book tells me what I'm supposed to do. I will tell you in a general way what my life was like as an active alcoholic, what happened to me, and what my life is like today as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Can everybody hear me? Good. I just do my best work in in the dark. (laughs) All right. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me. Uh, Even though I've been to Memphis Airport before a half a dozen times, I've actually never been in the state of Tennessee until today, so I'd like to thank Frank here. I mean, Doug. I do. I really think Doug has been very kind, and he took me, uh, Lou, and Linda around today to your beautiful city, sold lots of things, and it was pretty cool. And I, I'm really, that's one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my my coworkers who are sober don't understand. You know, I get invited to do these things. I said, only in AA, the bigger the nitwit you were, the more we like you. <laughs> I mean, if I was just a regular run-of-the-mill drunk, I'd be home in Philadelphia, but it's, it's good to be here. So um, I'll tell you what, what it was like. Um, first of all, I've got to ask you, how you doing? <laughs> you know, I'm doing good. How you doing? I was born and raised in a very blue-collar ethnic neighborhood in Philadelphia. I got seven brothers and sisters. Uh, we had no booze all in my house. Uh, my father did not drink, and my mother could not drink, besides being pregnant for almost 10 years. <laughs> sure. There is. There's eight of us within like a ten and a half year span. I got a sister who's 11 months older than me, and I got a sister 11 months younger than I. So we do got something in common, huh? <laughs> so, but um, there was no booze on my house. Um, uh, like I said, my father didn't drink, and he was smart enough not, uh, not to have booze in the house because my mom, besides being pregnant all those years, also uh, suffered from a history of mental illness. And uh, she abused prescription meds, and she did all those other things. My grandparents lived around the corner from us, and their basement was finished as a bar, and that's where all the family functions were held, the graduations, the christenings, and things like that, and that's where I had my very first drink. I didn't get drunk the first time I drank. I was just a kid, but I remember it was. It was Ballantine beer. I remember that because I remember going up to Connie Max Dady when my father and the old scoreboard in right center field, Ballantyne, used to sponsor the Phillies with the three rings, you know. And I didn't get drunk the first time I drank, but what I remember was I running around the basement bar polishing off the half empties or the half fulls. I guess it depends on your perception. <laughs> I'm running around polishing off the half empties, and it was my uncles. They were nudging each other and said, look at him, look at Bobby. See, I, and that's what I craved, the attention. I never felt a part of, and that would be true in my entire life, and that's pretty t- difficult to do when you got, you know, ten people living in a small three-bedroom row home, but I never felt a part of, and that would be true in early recovery. My drinking kind of took off in high school. Most of the kids in the neighborhood went to the local diocesan high school, but my parents had sent me to a private Jesuit high school, and right away I felt kind of different because most of the kids who went to the school were from affluent families from the suburbs, It was just me and a couple of the dirtballs in the neighborhood who went there. And we had a reputation because, you know, these kids, they were getting dropped off by their their parents and in their luxury automobiles. Me and the guys from the neighborhood were inside robbing their lockers. (laughs) And I knew that was wrong. I knew that by the values instilled in me, by the nuns as a kid and by my folks. But you know what? The need for us to be, uh, we th- I don't know, we, th- we thought we were gangsters. And we used to sell football pools, and if you hit, we didn't pay off. And, and, and if you wanted to buy, if you was looking to buy a couple things, we would sell you, uh, obviously, substitutes. You never knew what you were getting. But they never challenged us, and they, it was just nuts. And I remember my freshman year at the prep. It's September. It's football season. There was an away game. We rented a bus. There was drinking. There was fighting. There was police activity. It was really a lot of fun. And I remember our first day back to school, we all had to go see the disciplinarian. And he had about ten of us lined up outside the office. And they were all upperclassmen. It was just me and another freshman. We were the only uh, uh, kid from my neighborhood. We were the only two underclassmen there. 
And he made a beeline. He came right up to us. He said, what's with you guys? You guys here a couple of weeks and you're getting this jackpot already? And I just shrugged my shoulders. I said, you know, Father, just one of them things. And what it was, it didn't take me long to size up situations. I didn't play football, so I didn't hang out with those kids. Even though I did somewhat well academically, I didn't hang out with the AP kids. I was there about a week and a half. I found, who, found out who the nitwits were, and that's who I went to hang out with. And that would be the story of my life. It didn't take me long to size up situations. You know, and I didn't uh, make the dean's list, but I didn't fail out either. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by, and that would be... Uh, my pattern for the next number of years. Mediocrity was my goal, you know, and I was okay with that, you know. I didn't want any attention, good or bad. I just want to skate along, so I hope you didn't notice me. Now, this school was in North Philly, a pretty rough neighborhood. It's in the corner of 17th and Gerard. And three blocks away is the subway. At the end of the day, these, a lot of these kids would wait for the trolley car, the 15, that would take them out the three blocks to catch the subway. And me and the other kids from the neighborhood, two blocks away, there was a bar called the Ebony Showcase Lounge that sat on the corner of 15th and Gerard. And we went there for a couple of different reasons. The reason I went, it just wasn't, I know they had cold, cold beer and they had dancers and things like that. But there's a lot of times that I would stroll out to Gerard Avenue to show these guys from the suburbs how tough I was. I'm not a tough guy. I never was. But it was to impress these guys. And I can now tell you every time I went in the Ebony and I ordered a drink, I was terrified. I mean, I'm what? I'm 16. I look like I'm 12. I... I'm kind of dressed like I am now, you know, khakis, a blazer, you know, and, uh, but they figured if we was crazy enough to go in the bar, they might as well serve us, you know. <laughs> when it came time to graduate from the prep, I really had no desire to further my education, and I knew I couldn't stay home because there'd be hell to catch, and I knew I needed to get out of the house. And my options were limited. I had no money, had no skills, really, and then I had nothing. But the only thing that left to avail to me was the service, and I enlisted in the service. That really wasn't a bright move because a lot of guys weren't going. Uh, the military wasn't popular at that time, and uh, there were people living up in Lou's neighborhood up in Canada. But I went and I enlisted, and I went uh, after my training. I, I got sent overseas, and I spent 13 months overseas, and that's when my drinking really took off. I never messed around with another substances. I never even smoked a joint up to this point. You know what? I had a healthy fear. A lot of guys from the neighborhood had gone over and got whacked on certain things, and I had a fear of that stuff, so I didn't mess around with anything. But I definitely had a drinking problem when I went in. I was there a couple months, and several good friends of mine got killed, and I don't know how to handle that because in my family, we didn't talk about nothing. And that's not a shot at my folks. That's just the way it was. And once you moved out of the house, whether you went to school or you got married, you, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. You know, if you lived in the house, everything stayed inside you. And once you moved out, everything stayed within the walls of the house. And that's just the way it was. And I don't know how to, you know, deal with this. But I, I, I drank to numb the pain. And the same thing in the service. I didn't distinguish myself, but I didn't get any jackpots either. You know, I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. I just want to skate along and hope you didn't even notice me. When my tour was up, I came home. I wound up taking a couple civil service exams. And then I enrolled in school. I went to St. Joe's. And I was there, it was, I remember it was the end of the spring semester, uh, in May, and it was, uh, the Phillies had since moved, they're playing at Vet Stadium in South Philadelphia, and a couple guys from my neighborhood had called me up and said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow, one of those businessman specials, you know, like one of them Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon games, they said, you want to go? I said, sure, because they weren't going to miss me in the classroom, I mean, I went to St. Joe's back then, I don't think we had more than 3,000 kids in, uh, in the whole school. And the classes are small, and I wasn't participating in the classroom. Same thing there, not making the dean's list, but not failing out either, just skating along, hoping you didn't notice me. So I went to the, down to the game. It was an unusually warm day in May. I'm sitting up at the top of that 700 level, drinking that cheap watered-down beer, and the sun's beating down on me, and I'm getting trashed. And I told one of the guys I was with, I said, you know what I said? I want to run down on the field and meet one of the players. <laughs> And they said, okay, and they kind of shrugged me off because one of my nicknames I had was Bullshit Bob. I was a, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I did that. I didn't do nothing. I just made stories. I'm just sat in the bar. That's all I did. So. But I had worked my way down. They used to have a picnic area there. I jumped over the fence, and the San Diego Padres were in town. And Dave Winfield was the right fielder for the Padres. And I went running across the field, and I think I was in center field before anybody knew what was going on. Got out the right field, and I shook Dave Winfield's hand. I said, hi, Dave, how you doing? <laughs> And he looked at me and said, brother, what are you doing out here? And from behind him, I saw the guards coming. I said, Dave, i got to go now. <laughs> so I start running towards the infield. I want to slide into second base. But as I was running towards the infield, there was more guards coming from the third base side. And I knew I couldn't do that because if I slid into second, I'd get caught. So I turned around and started walking towards first base. And I'm as close as the guard as Cliff and I are right now. The real Cliff. And I'm walking... <laughs> 
and I'm walking like to give myself up. At the last second, I deked the guy, and I ran out in the airfield. Now I'm running around like a screwball. It seems like about 10 minutes, but it's probably closer, like maybe two or three, right? The place is going nuts. Up on the scoreboard, they put Mr. Excitement. I mean, I swear, they couldn't catch me. I mean, I'm just out of service. I'm in good shape. I'm joking. The driver running around. The place is going nuts. You know what? I got nowhere to go. I'm drunk. It's hot. I'm out of breath. I'm about to get sick. The fence is 12 feet high. I got nowhere to go. So I stop running. I wade out in the center field. I get surrounded by these short, young, fat guys. And now I made them look stupid. And they took me off the field. I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. The place was going nuts. They was taking me up to the bullpen, and Tug McGraw was in the bullpen for the Phillies. He gave me the thumbs up, like, way to go. Now, I knew I was going to get beaten from these guards. If that was okay, they could have beat on me all day long. I didn't care. Because you know what? I knew I could drink for free for the next week off this story. You know? <laughs> I'd be a legend, I know. But you know what? Now, this is the type of story I'd make up, you know, bullshit Bob. But I had them four guys from the neighborhood who had me. I knew by the time I got out of jail, they'd be back in the neighborhood talking about me, and I could drink for free. Just as I was about to get a beat, and the Philadelphia police lieutenant showed up. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, I'm just happy. Just happy to be here. <laughs> He said, well, you better get your happy ass out of the stadium. <laughs> so not only did he save me from getting beaten, but he also saved me from getting arrested. And that was important because one of them civil service exams kind of panned out a few months later. And I got hired by the Philadelphia Police Department. <laughs> they was hiring anybody back then. I got hired. There was 8,500 of us. Uh, our mayor at the time was a guy by the name of Frank Rizzo. Frank was a former cop and police commissioner, and he loved us, and we could do whatever we wanted to do. I wasn't even old enough to drink. The drinking age in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has always been 21. At that time, the drinking age in Jersey was 18. Where I lived in Philly, I could be across the bridge in Jersey quicker than I could be other parts of Philadelphia. We used to go to Jersey all the time. And, and it was tough drinking in Pennsylvania. You know, like, uh, I, I'm amazed when I travel and go to these different places and see where you can, like, buy beer and wine, like, in 7-Elevens. Man, that always floored me. It's, we couldn't do that back home. In Pennsylvania, the liquor, you had to go to the state store to buy the liquor. And the state store was always closed on Sunday, and it closed early. It closed, like, 6 o'clock. And to buy beer, you needed to buy a six-pack in the bar or go to the beer distributor and buy a case. There was no in-between, one or the other. So I always bought the case, of course, but, you know, but it was difficult to drink, you know, and, uh, you know, on election day, the, the bars be closed, you had to belong to American Legion Post and uh, things like that. But I used to go to Jersey all the time to drink. They, they, they made it really easy for us until I got on the job. I no longer needed to go to Jersey, even though I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite just 21. I had about a, about a couple months. But I remember when we got sworn in, we were holding our credentials. He said, fellas, in your hand, you're holding the ticket to the best show in town. And man, was he right, you know. I spent the first 10 years of my career in North Philadelphia where I would see the ravages of alcoholism and drug addiction day in, day out. And at the end of the tour, I would go out with guys from the squad. I would drink to numb the pain, you know. And I saw things on the job that bothered me, but I couldn't tell my coworkers that because I didn't want to be thought less than. I wanted to be one of the boys to the point where I engaged in behaviors. I knew my gut was wrong, the way I treated and spoke to people. And I did a number of things I'm not proud of. But the need for me to be accepted by my peers outweighed anything else. So whatever values or ethics I had one just went out the window. And it was ugly quickly for me, you know. I was at a family function one time and my uncle was there. My uncle was a boss in the job and he pulled me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You better take it easy. Or you're going to get yourself in the jackpot in one ear and out the other. I was at work one day and my immediate supervisor, he pulled me off to the side. He said, you know what, kid? He said, you're smart. And you're going to go places, but that booze is going to mess you up in one ear and out the other. Several years later, on two separate occasions, I ran into that supervisor and my uncle in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized I was talking to my uncle and uh, my uncle Jimmy. I said, man, I said, how come you didn't tell me? Because at that point, I, when I, I saw him, I knew he was trying to 12-step me. And he gave me one of them old-timer smiles. He said, Bobby, he said, you just weren't ready yet. Which just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the nonsense that went with it were necessary for him to hit my bottom. I mean, I'm the last guy to figure it out. You know, I made my first meeting in 1979. I, I don't tell people I went out because I really never came in, but I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> I'm at work one day, right, and on our job, one of my coworkers, he's out of his mind. In our job, we had a counseling unit on, on, the, on the job, and within that EAP unit, they had an AA group. And I remember I showed up at work one day, and the supervisor said, take this guy up to the unit. He's going to be detailed there for the day. I said, okay. And there was this little house that sat in a park, you know, uh, and I come down the driveway, and the name of the group was 369. 
And I come, come down the driveway, and there's a guy sitting on the porch. His name was Eddie, Eddie M. And Eddie and I worked out of the same building. He was downstairs. He was the turnkey. And I called, uh, pulled up, and I said, Eddie, I said, I'm going to drop this guy off. He's detailed here for the day. I'll be back at 4 o'clock to pick him up. He looked me dead in the eye. I said, kid, do you want to come in? I says, no, I don't. I was insulted that he even asked me. Because I know what alcoholics were. Alcoholics were you older guys, you married guys, you guys with the three heads. I mean, I didn't have a problem with alcohol. I was a beer drinker. I mean, and there's no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. It was those poor people I was dealing with in North Philly day in, day out. They was alcoholics. Christ, I mean, the only time I drank hard liquor was like on St. Patty's Day or New Year's Day or payday. But I was a beer drinker. <laughs> And you can't be an alcoholic drinking beer. <laughs> I needed back up for a moment. You know, that story I talk about running on the field, I told that story for a couple of different reasons. One, it's a true story. I got them four guys from the neighborhood to back me up. <laughs> Secondly, you know what? It, it's the only funny story I got. <laughs> I wasn't a funny guy. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a lover. I was none of that stuff. I was a lying, thieving, stinking, falling down, violent, drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused everybody I came in contact with, you know. It wasn't pretty. And thirdly, and more importantly, I was a blackout drinker. I, I blacked out just drinking. And, you know, Angie talked about it last night. I remember when I was at the VA hospital, the doctor asked me, he said, you ever have any blackouts? I said, no. I must have answered too quickly for him. He said, do you know what they are? I said, no. <laughs> Once he described them, I said, all the time. And that's what I did. I thought that's how you could tell you had a good load. If you blacked out, that was a good load. And I would come up to the corner, and the guys would tell me the things I did before, the night before. I said, oh, Bobby, you was a mess. And they'd be, be telling these stories. And a couple hours later, I'd be re repeating these stories like I remembered them, you know. Just a blackout drinking beer. And a little Irish whiskey and some wine, but predominantly beer. But, you know. It was, uh, it was, my, my, it was, my life was a shambles, you know. Uh, I was living with uh, girls, and they'd say, you know, Bobby, you're a nice guy, but you drink, you become an animal, you know. I was getting jammed up at work, you know, abused at sick time, doing other things, you know, wrecking cars, and I always lied about that, you know, and uh, all time, it, it, my life was just falling apart. I was sitting home from work one day, and I was reading the Daily News, and then there was a little article, and at the end of the article, there was a box, and they had some questions. It said, alcohol problems, drug problems, depression, marital problems, thoughts of suicide. I was four out of five. Because I was single. But I, you know, and if I was sure I was married, I'm in batting a thousand. And they talk about the moment of clarity. But as soon as it came, it quickly left. But I, made, I start, cut out that, wild, uh, that ad and I stuck it in my wild and I continued on drinking. You know, they talk about the moment of clarity. As soon as it came, it quickly left. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1988. Uh, guys I worked with, we were in trouble. So we went to the bar to get our story straight. And it just got to be a big drinking deal. You know, and one of the guys I was with decided that he was going to drive home. He said, I need to go. I said, OK. And I said, I'll give you a ride home. You know, this was before the term designated drivers. I'll give you a ride home. I don't think I was as drunk as he was. And he thought that was a good idea. So I got my car. It wasn't my car. It was a city car. And I was going to show off my driving skills. You know, I would see things like on television or the movies. And I would always try to duplicate that stuff. I was never successful, not knowing that everything is like prearranged, you know, set up in advance. So, uh, but I, that was just the arrogant type of guy that I was. You know, I could always do whatever you did. I could do better and all that other nonsense. I'm coming driving up the street. And there was a... It was a narrow one-way street, and uh, there was a big stone wall on my left-hand side. And a couple blocks away, I saw a kid riding towards me on a bicycle. And I decided I was going to play chicken with this kid because I thought it would be funny to see him jump uh, the curb and grab the wall. I thought that would be funny. He, my coworker, like that. Unfortunately, as we got closer in the same uh, at the sa last second, we turned in the same direction. I ran this kid over. As he lay bleeding on the hood of my car, I got out of my car. And my nightstick was going to beat this kid because I thought he was milking me in the city for an insurance claim. The guy that I was with prevented me from doing that. I pulled this kid off the hood of my car, threw him almost off to the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crump on bicycle from beneath my car and threw that off to the side of pe uh, like, a, like a piece of trash. I drove back to the bar. I made some sort of smart aleck remark, and I continued on drinking. When I came to it the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think anybody helped me because I was such a creep. I don't know what to do. So what I did do, I got a bottle of beer, a case of liquor, and some other substances, and I checked in the hotel to consume all this stuff to build up the courage in my life. And three days later, they're knocking on the door to kick me out of the hotel. And I couldn't shoot myself because at this point I was suspended from my job. I no longer had access to my weapon. So what I did do, I, uh, I opened up the window, and I was going to jump out the window. When I opened up the window, I, I, remember, I was on the fifth floor. I remember I was, I was afraid of heights. 
I made 23 jumps. I never overcame my fear of heights, you know. So I went in the bathroom and I had a bath, uh, filled the bathtub up with water and I had a blow dryer. And I was going to pull the blow dryer in the tub to make it appear an accidental electrocution. But every time I'd pull the blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. <laughs> uh, I was about a foot and a half short on cord and I'm like this, trying to lean up on it, plug it in. And it's okay to laugh, but you know, I never want to forget the pain I was in that day, you know. The only other tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin through my neighborhood. I guess I wanted to see something for the last time, you know. I started up the Falls Bridge and, uh, and come down the East River Drive. And the East River Drive is a very winding road along the Schuylkill River. And this was a weekday. This was like a Wednesday or Thursday around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Because this would be important because if it was any other time of day, I would have probably been succeeded in my goal, which was going to go, go on, on to oncoming traffic down my life. And I handled enough jobs like that, head-on collisions. I knew that would do the trick. And I'm flying down the drive, and, you know, like the speed limit, I think, is like 20 now. Or, and uh, I'm doing about 40 or 50, and I'm cooped, and I'm hungover, and I'm crying. And you know what? I, I re remembered something. I saw a lot of things on the job. I worked in a pretty rough area that that bothered me. But I saw one thing I experienced always haunted me, and I don't know why, because it wasn't the worst thing, far from the worst but when I was younger, I had a couple years on the job. I had to do a notification before. I had to knock on this guy's door and told him that his young son was killed in an automobile accident. And I remember when I told this guy, you know, uh, this guy aged right in front of me. I actually saw the life leave him, you know. I would see him a few weeks later. We're going through the court process, and he was like an old man. And back then, like, he had to be, he couldn't have been no more than 40. But you know what? I, I was always haunted by that, and I don't know why. My, when my intention to go into on comfort traffic, I remembered that guy and his family. And I knew that I never want to cause anybody the pain that that family went through. But I needed to end my pain, you know? So I decided I would wrap myself around one of those big old trees. They got these oak trees along the drive. And I decided that would do the trick. You know, I handle jobs like that. You know, them trees, they usually don't budge. And then I just started crying and I just lose it. And at the end of East River Drive is Boathouse Row. And I pulled over at the end of the drive and I just sat behind the wheel of the car and I cried like a baby for about 10 minutes. And I reached into my glove box and in my glove box was my wallet. I always carried an extra gun there. It wasn't there. But my wallet was there and inside the wallet was that article that I clipped out of Daily News about six weeks before. And it's no longer there but outside the last boathouse was one of those old glass enclosed phone booths. And I walked over and I dialed that phone number up that I had. And the woman who answered the phone, I spoke to this woman like I spoke to no one in my life before. I told her the truth. I told her everything that was going on in my life. I figured she didn't know me from a can of paint so I could always hang up. And I'm just talking to her, and God bless her, she listened patiently. And when I got done talking to her, she said, listen, why don't you drive over to Hahnemann Hospital? Somebody be waiting to talk to you. And I got in my car, and that's like about a five-minute drive, you know, go over to Hahnemann. And they were waiting for me. They admitted me to their 10th floor of their psychiatric unit. And they kept me there for about three or four days. It got me kind of stabilized. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in West Philadelphia. And I spent about six weeks in their flight deck. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in Coatesville. When I pulled over that day, Alcoholics Anonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't think I had a problem with alcohol. You know, uh, there was an important, uh, I, I left something out, there was an important thing. Uh, when I was 24 years old, I was involved in an incident uh, where I, I shot and killed a 15-year-old kid in line of work in a terrible situation that couldn't be avoided. They now have a term suicide by police, but that wasn't available. Uh, that wasn't out there then. Uh, there was a lot of help offered to me, and I, I held people at bay. You know, I didn't think they would understand, and I was just full of self-pity. And I crawled into a bottle, and that's what I did for my next three years. I wound up getting sober when I was 27. My drinking took me to a lot of my nevers, and one of those nevers was the use of other substances. I wound up getting promoted and transferred on my job, and I was, I was working one night, and I was drinking. My judgment was impaired, and I was put in a position where I thought I needed to do other substances, and that's what I did. My drug history is very short. It only lasted 17 months, and out of the respect of the fifth tradition, that's why I need to talk about that stuff. You know, it just went with the territory. When I pulled over that day to make that phone call, Alcoholics Anonymous wasn't, was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't think I had a problem with booze. I thought it was my short use of other substances. If I left that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe I got this mental illness. I inherited this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're talking about. I got this from the experience on the job. I got this from the service. Maybe it's the neighborhood I live in. Maybe it's the fact I'm a mummer. But it can't be booze because I'm a beer drinker, and there's no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer, you know? So I'm in the VA hospital out in uh, Coatesville, and... Uh, 
I, the first day I get there, so I guess between Hahnemann and the, the other joint, uh, Westfield, I got about six weeks under my belt. And I wander around. I got to get the lay of the land because the arrogance creeps back quickly in a guy like me. And I wander into the day room. And on the day room, on the large wall, they had the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, the large window shades. And I go up through the steps. I zip through all of them. I got about six of them done. I see the... I see the men. I said, they're screwed. That doesn't apply to me, you know. But what happened later that night, two men came up, and they were part of the treatment facility committee. Did not know that then. They came up to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment that the speaker said something about his background that I didn't like, couldn't relate to, or didn't identify with, I would immediately tune him out. I was too busy listening to the messenger and not the message. Now the arrogance really creeps in. Because I'm looking around, you know what, I'm not as bad as my, these guys, you know. A lot of these guys had legal problems. I didn't have any legal problems, none that I was aware of. Probably due to the fact because I had a gold shield in my back pocket. A lot of these guys had stay away orders from, the, from their wives and they had kids hate them. I didn't have that problem due to the fact that I'd never been married and didn't have any kids. I was too busy looking for the differences and not the similarities. But what bothered me the most without any question was at the end of the meeting, everyone got in a circle and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what you people are about, I don't want nothing to do with you because I hated God. You know, and I know they're strong words, but you know what? That's my feeling, and you know what? That doesn't even sum up the hate that I had. And I hated God for a couple of different reasons, and they were all legitimate. <laughs> the most important one was, I talk about my mom's mental illness. My mom was a fundamentalist in the church in the charismatic movement. She thought she could speak in tongues and things like that. And there was pictures and candles and all that stuff throughout the house. I came home from school one day. I was 15 years old. I came, I'm in the house about 10 minutes or so. And then I just wander, uh, you know, I go upstairs. I come across my mother. My mother had slit her wrist. I remember she looked up at me. She said, Bobby, help me. And I looked down, down at her. I said, good for you. And I walked out of the house. And I got an older guy to go to the state store, get a bottle of wine. I drank the wine. I came home later that night. And my father had told me what had happened. I acted surprised. I said, oh, yeah, how about that? That happened when I was 15. I didn't get sober until I was 27. That's 12 years of hating God. That'd be a couple more years before I even address this issue. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't hold hands. I didn't say the prayer. When it came time to get discharged from the VA hospital, I'm about to say to some police, it's not to get a joke, you know, it's not to get a laugh. A woman came up to me. She she was a nurse. She had to be a member of Al-Anon. She was a beautiful lady, and she saw all through my BS, you know. So all it was it was a facade to keep people at bay, you know, defense mechanism. And she said, you know what? The only way you're going to make it, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you, that's the best piece of advice I got. And that's where we get my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't get it at the VA hospital. The VA hospital helped me tremendously. They really did. They did a lot of good work with me, you know. They drained the oil and tightened the bolts. They did some great work. But I would get my recovery in AA. And I went to AA every single day, sometimes two or three times a day. It didn't matter, you know. I don't drink coffee. I've never had in my life, so I don't make it. I don't smoke cigarettes. I've never had in my life, so I don't empty any ashtrays. If I walked into a big book meeting or step meeting that was strictly by accident, I would leave it to break more important things to do. Tradition meetings. Rules. I need to tell you, my line of work, we love no force and we don't like to follow them for other people. But I went to meetings on a regular basis. You know, I was interested in speaker meetings, and the moment that the speaker said something about his background that I didn't, I didn't like, couldn't relate to, I didn't identify with, I would immediately tune him out. Too busy listening to the messenger, not the message. And I was crazy as a bed bug. I was sober 11 months, and I beat another man with a baseball bat. You know, I mean, I was just, uh, I, my life was a shambles, you know. Uh, I, well, my one-year uh, sobriety in my home group at that time, you would tell your story. So my one-year anniversary, I got done speaking. It was thunderous applause, you know. The blind could see, the lame walked. It was a really incredible experience. <laughs> And people came up and they pat him in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. I lied during the entire time. The fact that I identified myself as an alcoholic because my home group, you couldn't talk about that other stuff. And I didn't really believe I was an alcoholic. You know, I, again, I thought it was my short use of other substances. I thought it was the mental illness. I thought it was the stress stuff. You know, it was the neighborhood I live in. I'm a mummer. It's all this stuff. It can't be alcohol. I'm a beer drinker. You know? In fact, during the course of my story, a bottle of beer appeared in my head, but you guys didn't want to hear that. You wanted to hear all the quotes, and since I was somewhat on the ball and knew how to retain information and give it back to you, that's what I did. And they came up and they patted me on the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good, and I was dying inside. It was crazy, my early recovery. My first couple of years, right, I used to go to a lot of gentlemen's clubs, right, but, but I drank soda. And I would get my picture taken, like with the entertainer, 
and I would come to meetings and paste the pictures around to the old timers because I figured they would like that. <laughs> they, they would look at the picture and they would look at me and they would just shake their head and say, please, kid, please keep coming back. And, <laughs> and I thought they were being facetious. I said, all right, I'll keep coming back. You know, I had no idea who John Barleycorn was. I was wondering why everybody was blown his anonymity. I said, I says, I wouldn't want to tangle with him. You know, he's a pretty tough SOB, you know. When I found out who John Barleycorn was, I felt so stupid. Here I was, I was so damn bright, it damn near killed me, you know. I was, man, I was nuts. I used to, I, I, I was just under a year sober. I, was, uh, I went in this other bar uh, because they sold real good roast beef, right. And I'm drinking seltzer out of a rock glass. And a couple guys from the neighborhood, they come in. And they just start giving me a hard way to go. And you know what? The reason was I deserved it because I was an arrogant guy. I had a lot of, I was very aggressive on the job. I had a lot of publicity. Look at the angels coming. There we go. <laughs> Sitting in the front row too. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame the guy next to you. You could do that in the back row. Hey, it's in my row. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, so, isn't it? <laughs> it well, it works. That's great. So I'm sitting in this bar, and I order, uh, you know, I'm, I'm drinking seltzer, and these guys from the neighborhood, and they come in, and they decided that they, they thought it was necessary to knock me down a few pegs, and I couldn't understand because I was an arrogant guy. But the one guy just got too close to me, and I stood up, and I punched him right in the face with the rock glass, and I cut him open, man. I blood, he bled like a pig. And the uniform guys came in, handled a job. I knew one of the guys. He pulled me off. He said, man, what are you doing here? What are you nuts? And I told him what happened. He said, get the hell out of here. And that's where I learned my lessons about people, places, and things. And I have since found a place that sells real good roast beef without being in that type of environment. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, we'll go out and we'll grab the sandwich. you know. But, but that's how nuts I was. I did everything wrong you could do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a liar, thief, and a cheat. I was a creep with the new women. I did everything wrong you could do in AA. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't pick up a drink. The only time I got my hand up to, take, to share was to take a shot at somebody. You know, I was nuts. My second anniversary came and went. I didn't celebrate it. One month after my second anniversary, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had 25 months before, but 25 months before, I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life was unmanageable. <laughs> I hated everybody, but you know what I hated the most? I hated the new guys. You know, because I remember my very first meeting, you know, my very first meeting after I got out of the VA. I went to this group, and there was a man and wife celebrating 10 years sobriety. The wife had one more day than her husband. And she constantly reminded him of that throughout her story. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I said, 10 years, you know, maybe you can go over the bridge and drink in Jersey and keep your Pennsylvania time. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. But there was a dude from my neighborhood. His nickname was Troubles. And that was a hard-earned nickname. And he was sober a little over a year. Because I couldn't believe, you know, go years without drinking. I was impressed with this guy because this guy I knew. Like he was in and out of jail. Like he was in and out of uh, Holmesburg in, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And he was sober. And I, I was impressed by him. I didn't believe you people at the time. But after I'm sober for a couple of years, now I believe I may be string a couple of years together. All right, I'll go along with that. But, you know, I hated, I hated the new guys coming in because you know what they were getting better before me i would see these guys come in and they'd be rambling idiots and you know here it is like six months later they're making complete sentences you know and they a year later they got their teeth fixed they got a driver's license they even getting a date here and now and i would see these guys and i hated them the most i said how dare they get it before me the reason they got better before me they were willing to take some action before i was and i wasn't ready to take any action you know i was from the school thought just don't drink just don't drink and go to a meeting I'm a pretty bright guy. Well, why do I need to go to a meeting if I could just don't drink, you know? And when people say just don't drink, that kind of, to me, implies willpower. And you know what? Um, I'm powerless over alcohol. I mean, I tried to stop drinking lots of times, you know, because on the job I was getting jammed up, abusing my sick time, so I go on the wagon for a bit. I was living with somebody at the time, and she was threatening to leave me, so I would go on the wagon for a bit. Even try to give it up for Len every now and then. I, I quit lots of times, but my problem was staying quit, you know? But I hated those guys the most. My, my uh, home group at the time, we had a cork board, first name, last initial, day, the month, and how many years you're celebrating. I'm not proud of this, but this is a true story. If Joey A got three years and Bobby C got two years and Joey A went out, is it good for him? He's out, I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> this is about time. I thought this, everyone, you know, that's what the deal was. You got seven years, I got five, you outranked me. I mean, I was all about rank, you know, I was nuts. 
The guys came up to me one day and they kind of tricked me. The way you trick somebody new, you don't give them a chance to formulate the lie. They came up to me and said, Bobby, are you working this weekend? And before I knew it, I said, no, it's too late. I wish I could have pulled the words back. They said, we're going on retreat this weekend. We want to take you. I said, oh, Christ. I, know what, I tell you, one of the worst nights to go to meeting was on Sunday night after a retreat. I'd be in meetings on Friday and Saturday. Where the hell is everyone at? And then Sunday night, here they come, floating in. I said, oh, man. <laughs> You know, you know what? I never left the meeting. I don't know why I was just taught I never left. But I would sit there. I said, oh, Christ, I can't put up. And they're all, oh, stop, man. So they came up and they said, uh, we want to go uh, take you on a retreat. And the truth is, I'm making fun of these guys. But you know what the deal is? They were good men. They really were. They were really good men. They were just looking out for my best interest because I was incapable of doing that myself, you know. And uh, so I said, okay. So I go on the retreat Friday morning. I'm in the back seat with a guy on each side of me. It's role reversal. I work, I drive, you're in the back. But here I'm in the back seat with a guy on each side of me. And we get up to the retreat house. It's like a set, it's a Friday afternoon. It's around 4.35 o'clock. Say, Bobby, we want to introduce you to the retreat master. And I said, all right, let's get this over with, right? So they take me down this long hallway. They knock on the door. The guy answers. I go in. He stands up. He gives a big old smile. And he comes up and he hugs me. He's my disciplinarian from high school. But not only that, but he was also a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He came up to me. He said, oh, I knew you had a problem. How you doing? Wants to know what's going on, where I'm going to meetings. You know, he asked you, who's, who's your sponsor? I said, I don't have one. Now, I'm a pretty bright guy. He knew that. He knew I was a sharp guy. And he said, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. So I asked my roommate to be my sponsor. God forbid, should I ever be quizzed again? Who's your sponsor? There he goes right there. And the only time I talk to this guy is then when I accidentally bumped at him in the meetings. He would wave to me and say, Bobby, I still got that same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. I never called him. Know what I used to do? I used to tell other people, you won't believe this guy. He wants me to do this. He wants me to do that. He did that. He didn't do nothing. He put the hand of AA out there. Not only did I slap it away, but then I character assassinated. I lied about the guy. He, he was a good man. I was just nuts. So like I said, a month after my second anniversary, 25 months sober, Regular tenants of meetings. Regular tenants of meetings. I want to eat my gun. I go to a Friday night meeting. Friday night Wissanoming meeting, step meeting. Troubles is at the meeting. And I knew Troubles is for real, you know. And uh, he has this glow about him. I knew he was for real. See, that's why I kept coming back. Troubles was the reason I came back. But as much as I hated God, I knew God was working by these newer people because I didn't believe you with your length of sobriety. But when I saw these crazy lunatics come into the room, get better before my eyes, I knew there was God working. I just would later find out what I had was a misdirected resentment, but I didn't know that then. I go up to Bobby uh, because he didn't like to be called troubles. I go up after a meeting and said, Bobby, I need, I need some help. I said, would you help me? Would you be my sponsor? He looks at me. He said, Bobby, I've been watching you these past couple of years, and I'm sticking my chest out. I said, yeah, he kind of likes me. He says, I need to tell you. He said, you're full of shit. <laughs> That's not the reaction I'm looking for. <laughs> he says, I'm going to be your sponsor under certain conditions. Hey, you're going to call me every single day. You're going to go to a big book meeting a week. You're going to go to a step meeting a week. You're going to go to a men's meeting a week. You want to get yourself a coffee commitment, and you want to leave them damn women alone. And I'm saying to myself, who's he talking to? I'm sober 25 months. I'm selling the grapevines. I got it going on here. <laughs> but what I did do, I looked him dead in the eyes. I said, okay, that's what I'm willing to do. All right, well, I'll go. So after the meeting, we went back to his house, and he introduced me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We did some reading for a bit. I did a lot of listening because that's what I was told to do. And then when we got done, we said the third step prayer together. And when we got done doing the third step prayer, after we got off on our knees, we stood up. And he said, Bobby, the way we do a third step, we pick up paper and pen and we do a fourth step. So, whoa. <laughs> Easy does it. <laughs> uh, let's keep this simple. I don't want to do one of these. I'm going to meetings and people say, oh, I'm doing this inventory. I feel like drinking. Oh, you know, I'm going out and, you know, all this other stuff. I want to eat my gun. You can't get no further out than that. So I did my inventory. You know what? It wasn't that big, bad thing. It wasn't really, it wasn't that difficult. That next step, that was a difficult one. <laughs> but I'm a pretty sharp guy. I got this figured out. I called my sponsor up. I said, Bobby, I'm going on a retreat this weekend. I'm doing a fifth step with the priest. He said, Bobby, that's great. When you get done, stop my, by my house so you can do it with me. <laughs> and you know, sometimes like you're on the phone with your sponsor. Like, what's he deaf? You hear what I say? You know? 
for what I did do, before I could say something flippant, uh, he told me, he said, Bobby, my job is your sponsor. This is a journey. Um, I'm, the, I'm supposed to help you with these character defects. I think I need to know what they are, even though I have a good idea. And he hung up on me. <laughs> The reason I want to do the fifth step with a priest, it was not to be spiritually enlightened. I have God. I got the church on the list. I, hate, I still hate God. I still hate the church. It wasn't to be spiritually enlightened. There were a lot of things about my past I was embarrassed about. But I knew by my training as a kid that if I spoke, uh, spoke to the priest, it would be between me, him, and a lamppost. Nobody else would know. See, I was afraid to go to my sponsor for the fear that he would, uh, he would ridicule me. He would pass judgment. Or even worse, he would break the confidence and tell other people. That's why I didn't want to go to my sponsor. And that tells you that my fear list wasn't quite completed. I never did that fifth step with a priest. I did it with my sponsor. And none of those things happened. Because when I got done, he didn't ridicule me. He didn't pay his judgment. In fact, and I don't think he ever told anybody else. But what he did, he shared some of his experience with me, which took away the terminal uniqueness in which I thought that I had experienced. See, he had taken someone's life in a bar fight and gone to prison. Now, that's not why I asked him to be my sponsor. But there were other ways. I, ju I just loved the way he carried himself. You know, he had the glow. I saw him in the neighborhood. It just wasn't in the hour and a half in the meeting. I saw him in the neighborhood, and he was the real deal. And uh, that's why I asked him. And uh, so when I got done doing the fifth step, I'm about to roll. He said, whoa, whoa, where are you going? You know, uh, he had a choir room. He led by himself. He had a choir room set up in his house. He said, you need to sit there quietly for an hour. Now, I can never sit quietly, you know. I tell you, serene people scared the hell out of me. I would, I would go to meetings and it was all calm and stuff. That's when I would get my hand up to get it crazy and sit back and watch the show, you know. Uh, you know, uh, you know the old saying, you can't miss what you never had? Well, I never had a peace of mind. That's why I never missed it, you know. But I sat down quietly and uh, I can only share my experience. And you know what? The screaming inside stopped. And I must have been more than an hour because he actually knocked on the door. And you know what? I didn't, I didn't nod off. I didn't do any of that stuff. I wasn't uncomfortable with myself. It's just hard to describe. But the screaming inside stopped. At this point, I'm sober maybe 32, 33 months, give or take. Because I kind of, you know, that four step, you know, um, pain's a real good motivator. Uh, so there were a lot of times when I was trying to stay sober on yesterday's sobriety, just kicking back, things are cool. But whenever my back got against the wall, that's when I would do some more work, you know. I don't suggest you do it that way, especially if you know, but I can only tell you my experience, you know. We didn't burn my fourth step when we did the fifth step because he would say that I would need these for the next, you know, next few steps. Character defects, I didn't know what these were. I knew when I drank I was a character. I found out when I took my inventory that I had no character whatsoever, you know. I had a really uh, a warped uh, sense of, uh, of my uh, self-identity. I thought I was the greatest cop in the city. I thought I was the great uncle and all this stuff, you know. And it uh, turned out that I wasn't as what I thought I was, you know. I, and the, the deal was, you know what, I, was, uh, I wasn't reliable. I wasn't dependable. I wasn't trustworthy. I missed family functions. Uh, when I did go to family functions, I showed up and I was an embarrassment to the family. I engaged in behaviors at work that compromised the ethics and values that, uh, that uh, ruined uh, the reputation of some hardworking, decent men. I engaged in behaviors that put other people at risk. You know, so I wasn't what I thought I was. You know, and, and that was, a, you know, I told people I didn't always have a spiritual awakening. I had a rude awakening. You know, <laughs> but a sixth step I became, you know, was willing and the seventh step is a prayer. And my, my sponsor says, Bobby, you need to put legs on those prayers. I mean, I got a laundry list of character defects, and I don't need to share all of them with you. Because, like Angie said, I'm not doing a fifth step tonight. Uh, but uh, one of my character defects is uh, sometimes I may not be the most patient guy in the world, you know. And I could pray all day long, God, help me be patient, help me be patient. But during the course of my day, should I come across you and our paths cross, and then you kind of push my buttons, and I lash out in sarcasm, Patience goes right out the window. That prayer goes out the window. Sarcasm is nothing but anger. It's also referred to as language of the Irish. But if I lash out, and say, if I lash out in sarcasm, that prayer for patience goes right out the window. You know, you know, God will do for me what I can't do for myself. But this is a program of action. You know, I used to be one of those guys. I turned it over. You know, I never turned nothing over. That was code for I'm not doing nothing. You know, so. The A step, because I didn't burn my four step when I did the fifth step, half my A step was done and I had to throw more names down there, you know. I used to go to eighth and ninth step meetings and say, oh, I never harmed anybody but myself. That should have been a tip off I never did my inventory because once I got done my inventory, I found out that I harmed everybody I came in contact with and unfortunately those closest to me the most, I harmed the most, you know. And I had to throw more names down there. 
And if I wasn't willing, I could pray for the willingness. The ninth step direct amends. You know, I'd like to share an experience on the ninth step. I'm at a meeting, I guess this is probably about 15, 16 years ago. This meeting's in North Philadelphia. Now, I live in South Philadelphia, and I'm sitting at this table, and I see this guy walk down the steps. And as soon as I saw this guy, I recognized him. He was not on my A step, not for any fear or anything like that. I just plain forgot. They say more will be revealed. He came down the steps. It was revealed. I needed to make amends to this guy. What I used to do, we and uh, um, his name was Bob. We used to drink together. Bob was, I, for some reason, I liked fighting bigger guys. I, I don't know why. I wasn't good at it, but I did it anyway. <laughs> But one day he and I had words and he kind of backed down. So from that point on, whenever I want to impress anybody how tough or nuts I was, I would peck on Bob. And a couple of verbal taunts. And one day I slapped him open hand too. That's like really an insult. He didn't do nothing. Then one day I spat upon him. I mean, what worse utter degradation than spitting on your fellow human being, you know? I recognized him right away, but he didn't recognize me. So I got introduced to speak and I stood up and I looked him dead in the eyes. And my name is Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. Now, I need to take a moment here and, and tell you why you use my full name. I know these traditions are top secret stuff here, and we're not going to go into detail. And God, I'm not even going to mention the concepts. But here, the traditions, I mean, these are kind of really misunderstood, and no more so than this 11th tradition. You know, when we get sober, it's like we join the mafia. Everyone gets a nickname. There's John the Brick and Jimmy the Coat and Pepsi George and Bucktooth Mary and Red Sweater Jerry, and the list goes on. Everybody in my neighborhood knows I was a stark raven lunatic drunk. It was those little telltale signs. They come outside, they catch me, I'd be urinating on their car. My girlfriend threw the clothes out the window. I'm slumped behind the wheel of my car. All of a sudden, God forbid, my reputation should be tarnished by people finding out I'm going alcohol synonymous. You know? God forbid you want to drink 3 o'clock in the morning calling information. I'd like to have Frank the Fox's phone number. <laughs> you want to go visit one of these beloved old-timers, you want to go to the hospital. Yeah, I'm here to see Jimmy the Coat. <laughs> the 11 tradition is real clear. Personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. That means you will never see my face clearly identified. I love them old Long Ranger masks back in the day. They're pretty... <laughs> Well, I don't want to tip my hand there, but they're pretty sharp. But, you know, uh, you go, uh, you will never see my face clearly identified along with my name, which happens to be Robert Ignatius Benedict Coyle III, followed by a statement, is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That would be a violation of the 11th tradition. Dr. Bob in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, which is a great book, Dr. Bob went on to say, when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that is a violation of the 11th tradition. He went on to further say that anonymity is spiritually inspired and secrecy is feared inspired. And this is not a secret society. However, I have no right whatsoever to break your anonymity. I was involved in service back home, Area 59. We use our full name. A lot of people do so. But I have no right to break anybody else's anonymity. So I looked this guy dead in the eye say, my name is Bobby Coyle, I'm an alcoholic. He nodded, he recognized me then. When I got done sharing, I told the group uh, I, I, what I needed to do. See, because making amends for me, I always thought it was, you know, making amends was two words, I'm sorry. And, and that's not making amends. Because for me, those two words that don't mean squat. I was taught that making amends is righting the wrong. Now, if I owe you money, it's real easy. I go in my pocket, I pay you, or I go on a payment plan. But what about that emotional damage or the psychological damage? How do I make amends for that? How do I right that wrong? I was told that you sit down, you have conversations with people, you explain your behavior, and from that point on, you assume the responsibilities that you, had, you know, that you gave up before. Like I sit down, I talk to my dad and tell him all the things I did. I make, make amends, I right the wrong, I give him the money back. But from that point on, I become a son again. That's important, my action after I sit down and have a conversation with somebody. So how do I make amends to Bob? See, you know, I figured if I humiliated him publicly, the least I can do was to make amends to him publicly. It wasn't a grandstand, you know. So I, I looked him dead in the eye. I said, Bob, I'm truly sorry for the way I treated you. And as long as I stay sober, I hope I never treat another human way, the way I treated you. You know what? He came up and he hugged me. It was an incredible experience. So after the meeting, we start talking. I said, Bob, because like I said, this meeting's in North Philly. I live in South Philly, and he lives in the Roxborough section, which is like Northwest Philly. So we start talking. I said, Bob, what brings you here tonight? He said, Bobby, I'm sober. Three years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, get out of here. Now the arrogance creeps back in because everybody in Philly knows me. I'm not saying they like me. I'm just saying they know me. 
<laughs> I've been involved in service. Everyone knows who I am. So, and uh, our paths never crossed. I said, what made you come here tonight? He said, Bobby, I was just wanted to go to a different meeting tonight. Just wanted to check something out, and I was flipping through the meeting directory. We have 1,600 meetings a week. Our meeting directory is like 80 pages thick. I believe that my God put that guy in my path, that, and I had two options. I can do what I did, or I could do what I always did. See, the nice thing about having eight siblings in a 10-year span, there's a close resemblance to each other. And people will come up and say, you SOB, I remember you. I said, no, no, you're talking about my brother Brian and my brother Sean, not me. <laughs> and I had to make my amends to my brothers, you know, <laughs> passing the buck, you know. And you know what? It was an incredible experience. Now, the flip side of that, my home group was the Stepping Stones group in Northeast Philadelphia for a while. I was at a business meeting one day. I made a motion. It was definitely for the betterment of AA. It had to because I made it. <laughs> Unbelievable thing happened. I swear to God, I've never seen this before. The motion doesn't get seconded. That's like unheard of. Even the craziest motions always get seconded just because you feel sorry for the person making the damn thing. Oh, Christ, that's nuts, but I'll give them a second. You know, just make them feel good. Well, that doesn't happen, and what even amazes me even more, because there's a friend of mine in the room. Now, I grew up in the neighborhood. We had certain rules. They may be a bit goofy, and, but their neighborhood rules just the same. You always backed your boy. Right, wrong, or different, you always had your back. It didn't matter whether you got beat up with him. You could always resolve that later, but you always had his back. You can never date anybody else's ex. I'm sorry, you dated Frankie in the third grade. I can't talk to you. I mean, certain rules. <laughs> Everyone knows there's rules in the neighborhood. Well, I'm at this meeting, and I'm looking at them. I'm, we're making eye contact, like, get the hand, and he doesn't get the hand up. I can't believe it. My motion goes down in flames. I'm at work one day. My co-worker comes up to me. He was in the program. He came up to me. He said, Bobby, Freddie Wheels is outside. He wanted to take care, take care of some sort of business. I peeked out the window. I said, tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall. He can't do that here. A few weeks later, that same co-worker called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels died last night. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. Here he was, was a friend of mine. And as God is my judge, I cannot tell you what that motion was about. That's how petty it was. Put my path many, many times. I will walk into the room there before men there. I, I would say hi to Tariq and completely ignore Freddie. You know? And the moment that the, my co-worker said, because Bobby, he always spoke so highly of you. I felt about yay big. And I've been praying for Freddie ever since. See that key word in the ninth step, wherever possible. See, I used to thought that whenever possible. And you know, wherever is place, whenever is time. And for me, it's never the right time because I'm too busy easy, doesn't it? You know, God will put people in my path. And it's important to take care of those, take, take advantage of those opportunities. And that's two experiences in the ninth step. One where I took advantage of it and it was a credible reward. The other, I failed to. And I paid the price. The 10 step for me is nothing but 4 through 9 on a regular basis. Now, if I want to stand up here and tell you I do a 10 step every day, that's not true. But I'm pretty good with it, though. Sometimes 5, 6, maybe 7 times a week. Then there's other times, you know, 2 or 3 times. And I always used to say, you know, if I'm not practicing these principles, no one knows but me. That's not true either. Because when I'm not practicing these principles, I operate in nitwit mode. <laughs> Should you cross my path in nitwit mode? You too are affected, you know, and it's amazing because, you know, now I can laugh at myself and I think that's a gift and hey, hey, I can never laugh before. But, you know, I can laugh at myself sometimes because, you know what, every time I get jammed up like that, I say, man, well, what a moron. You know, like, see, so you know, the old saying, like I said before, you can't miss what you never had. I never missed a piece of mind because I never had the damn thing. But now when I get knocked off the beam, I know what I need to do to get back on the beam. And for me, that's the 10th step, you know, and I'm pretty consistent with it. And I enjoy that because, you know what? I no longer like insanity. In fact, to be honest, I get kind of uncomfortable with it. Now, I, can, I know I can flip. If I, got good, I, got, I can get into it. If I, but, I, but I hate doing that. You know, I just get not my stomach. I just don't like living like that today. The 11th step through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact. I pray and meditate on a daily basis. And I don't want to tell you the way I do it just for one reason only. I don't want to offend anybody because there may be some new people here. Up to this point, I have been giving you my experience. I'm about to give you my opinion, which I never hardly give, but whenever I do, I always qualify. That's what the hospitality room is for, the opinions. In fact, we were actually talking earlier this morning. We had a few more minutes. We could have probably solved, solved all the problems in AA. But uh, this is my opinion. This is why Alcoholics Anonymous is so successful. They allow me, the literature gives me a lot of good suggestions, but you guys allow me the freedom to pray and meditate in which way that I'm comfortable. And I've tried a lot of different things. If there were 
only one way to pray and meditate, I guarantee you I would not be here tonight. So I thank you for giving me that opportunity to, to find my path. And then it has been a path. I tried a lot of different things. And the way I pray to me, uh, meditate, uh, I'm comfortable with. And I've been doing about 11 years. And I, and, but I'm just glad you guys, AA gives me the freedom to pray and meditate in which I'm comfortable. The 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I did the steps and that's the result. I had a spiritual awakening. Now, I haven't seen any burning bushes, any lightning bolts. I haven't heard voices from above. In fact, it's been a number of years since I heard any voices at all, and I'm truly grateful for that. <laughs> we tried to carry this message. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been to thousands of meetings since I've been sober, and I hear some crazy things, and I scratch my head, and I look up the slogans and make sure I'm in an AA meeting. That's the message. The most important part of that, though, is to practice these principles in all my affairs. I'm only in an AA meeting an hour and a half a day. What about the other 22 and a half hours? What about the time at work? Or what about the time in my neighborhood where it's tough to do the right thing sometimes, you know? That's what I got to deal with, you know? But the most important word in that 12 step also is try. We tried to carry this message, you know? I went through my evangelical stage. I had the fireman's hat on. I can quote the literature and I would quote it to you. When I got done, I would backhand you with the book to make sure the message sunk in, you know? <laughs> I was at a meeting one time. There was an old timer pulled me off to the side, and I'm glad he did it this way. He said, you know what? He said, you really have a nice message. He said, but you offend people the way you come off. First of all, I was appreciated that he waited to the end of the meeting and didn't cross talk. But not only that, but I really appreciated the way in which he addressed me. You know, he wasn't taking a shot at me. He was sharing his experience, strength, and hope. He was giving me some good direction. And you know what? I kind of mellowed out, but you got to hear me on this. Not to the point where I compromise the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe strongly in the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. But you know what? It's, it's sometimes it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. And, and that's what I've learned over the years. And that just comes with, with trial and error. You know, I've made some mistakes, you know. I, I then got involved in service and I learned about the 12 traditions. Because that's what the 12 steps says, you know. Our preamble, we read it every day in a meeting, is nothing but a condensed version of the 12 traditions. You know, our primary purpose and how it works says our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. If I'm just staying sober and not helping other alcoholics, that's half measures and half measures of us nothing. You know, we came up with a statement of uh, responsibility. I am responsible when anyone anywhere reaches out for help. For, uh, I want the hand of AA to always be there. For that, I'm responsible. I can't worry what other people are doing. And the 12-step work takes many different forms and fashions. You guys, this committee, this is 12-step work. This is great, you know. There's various 12-step committees, corrections. You know, I tell you, uh, I know jail's not for everybody. Uh, I'll tell you experience. A number of years ago, uh, my sponsor calls me up. He said, Bobby, we're taking a Monday night meeting. We're going up to uh, Holmesburg. It's since been closed. I said, no, no, we're not. He said, yes, yeah, sure. I said, I'm not going. He said, you are. Uh, you, know, you know how that goes. I went. Because, uh, but I didn't think I had nothing in common with these guys. I thought I would need to embellish my story. I thought I would need to use a lot of profanity. I said, I really don't want to go. So I pick them up, and we drive up. You know, we have dinner. We go up there. Well, you know, a couple of days before, like Friday or Saturday, I kind of figured it out. Monday night football. The Eagles are playing the Cowboys. I definitely can't go. So I call him up. I said, Bobby, you know, I got something going on. He saw right through it. He said, Bobby, you gave me your word. It's a commitment. And besides, if you pick up a drink, I don't think Randall Cunningham's going to 12-step your ass. And he hung up on me. <laughs> so we go up to Holmesburg, and then we get buzzed in and go through that, all that mess, right? And you know what? No one shows up. They're all on the block watching the game. <laughs> Now I really got an attitude because when I leave, I told one of the CEOs, I guess you transferred all your alcoholics up to Greaterford, which is a state penitentiary. And uh, he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So I'm driving home. I got the game on the radio trying to listen to it. And he wants to talk to me. I said, oh, Christ, we shut the hell up. I'm trying to listen to the game. And then he turned around. I said, you don't get it, you selfish SOB. We were here just in case somebody showed up. We are responsible for the effort, not the outcome. And besides, we hung out tonight. We had dinner. We had a nice night. And I begrudgingly, I'd agree with them. It was a nice night, but I really want to check this game out. You know? So, uh, you know what? If I'm willing to accept the, uh, the accolades for all the successes, then I better be willing to accept the responsibility for all, all the failures. And unfortunately for me, my failures far outnumber the successes. My dad called me up a number of years ago. Uh, Joe lived across the street. Joe had a toilet of a bar on the corner. And, uh, you know, if you had said, where's, this, where's the toilet? I said, you're standing in it. 
<laughs> Joe kicked me out of his bar, flagged me towards the end of my drink, and then used some colorful language that he would threaten me with bodily harm should I go anywhere near the toilet of a bar that he owned. And he knew what I did for a living, and he knew my family. He watched me grow up. That, he wasn't impressed by that. And I said, okay, Joe, I just found another dump to drink in. So one day my father he called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Joe, uh, Joe wants your number. He said, can I give it to him? I said, sure, Dad, give it to him. That's why my name's in the phone book. I don't talk from anybody. I dropped the Benedict, even though that's back in vogue. It's Robert Ignatius Coyle III, 707 Sears Street, you know. That's why I make meetings on a regular basis. You know, I don't go to meetings for the fear that I'm going to drink. I make meetings. I don't go often as I used to. I probably go about five times a week now because Mondays and Wednesdays are my long days at work. But I go to meetings because, you know what, the newcomer doesn't know that I live at 707 Sears Street. That's why I go to meetings. If I go to meetings and some of my sponsees come up and want to talk to me and I haven't heard from him for a while, I say, man, you got my number. Let's talk to that dude. He, we don't know him. You know, so uh, Joe calls me up. He said, Bobby, he says, do you still go to the AA meetings? I said, yeah, Joe, I do. And he knew because in my neighborhood, bad news travels quickly. <laughs> no one wants to tell the good news. Like, you know, Frankie got promoted or Salvi got, you know, he got engaged or something like that. Everyone, you know, Joey violated parole. Uh, you know, that's the stuff they want to know, all the bad news. So I said, yeah, Joe, I still go to AA. He said, I was wondering if you can help me. Joe had four kids of his own, and then his brother had a, uh, four kids, and his, his brother and his sister-in-law were killed in an automobile accident coming back from the Jersey Shore one weekend. And so Joe took his nephews and nieces in and raised them as his own. And you talk about a, a man. I mean, this is what he, he stepped to the plate, and he raised his kids up. And his nephew, Jimmy, who was 17 years old, just got out of treatment. He said, Bobby, I was wondering if you could take Jimmy to an AA meeting. Now, here was a guy years before who was threatening me with bodily harm if I came to anywhere near the dump of a bar that he owned. And now he wanted me to take his nephew, his son, to an AA meeting. You know, and I didn't have to run around and tell Joe that I was in AA. Jay, Joe knew just when he would stop, when I would stop up and see my pop. I mean, I would visit my dad and I would talk to Joe. We'd talk sports for a little bit. But he could tell looking in my eyes. He knew that I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And so that, that was an incredible reward. But I got involved in service, you know, and uh, I had plans. I had, in 1993, I become uh, the alternate delegate for my area, Area 59. And I was going to be the youngest delegate ever to the General Service Conference. Who that delegate was and how old they were, I had no idea, but it was going to be me. You know? <laughs> it's funny, I had since found I was very friendly with the girl who actually was the youngest delegate. My friend Christine from Michigan was the, actually the youngest delegate, but I thought it was going to be me. And then... Uh, I got 1993, I got diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer. I never smoked in my life before. I mean, a little reefer for a short period of time, but that don't count. But I never smoked a cigarette in my life. And I remember uh, I was floored. I couldn't believe this. So I went to go get a second opinion. Actually, what I was trying to do, I was getting ready to run the Marine Corps Marathon. I wanted to do Boston. And to do Boston, uh, you, you need to qualify. Now, they do a lottery, but most guys qualify. So I'm training to do the Marine Corps Marathon. And I wound up getting sick. Uh, things just weren't right. So I get checked out. I got diagnosed with lung cancer. I said, man, it started like with a pain in my shoulder. Like I tripped one day when I was running. I thought that was what it was. So I went to get a second opinion. It got confirmed. I couldn't believe it. I'm sober. I got things to do. I'm back in school. Things are happening. And I talked to my sponsor. And he said, Bobby, what the hell you want to do about this? I said, I don't know. And the truth was I was scared, you know. And so then I got kind of sick and I went to a treatment. I did pretty good, you know. I get bounced back. Then I got really sick, you know. Chemo, radiation, surgery. Actually, they removed the lower left lobe of my lung. And I had to give up my position in the area. And that was tough for me. It was, it was tough only because of ego. That's the only reason it was tough. But the truth was the area would better serve. I didn't have the strength. And I was in the hospital for a bit. And after I got out of the hospital, I was laid up in my house for a number of weeks. I couldn't make meetings. I mean, you do, I'm always made meetings. I was a meeting maker, you know. I couldn't make meetings. I just didn't have the strength. And people start coming to my house to carry the message of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. It just wasn't home group members. It just wasn't friends. It was somebody that it may have meant once at the assembly. Or it's people bringing friends, coming to the house to carry the message to me. I'm a taker. I took my entire life. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery. And people coming to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm a firm believer in the, that my doctors did a pretty good job, but I'm definitely a believer in the prayer of Alcoholics Anonymous, which helped me, you know. And I've been back and forth, but I do pretty good. It's been like two and a half years since I had any treatment. I kind of glow in the dark a little bit, but I'm, things are doing all right. <laughs> and you know, when I got the news, I thought I may have an excuse to go out and get loaded, but you know what? I didn't have a reason to go out and get loaded. I had a pretty good life. You know, the one thing it did to help me finish up that nice step work, you know. It was tough, that guilt I was instilled as a kid. I still got some of it, so, but... Uh, 
But uh, I got a pretty good life today. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful way of life. I was in Mexico a number of years ago, and I thought I could speak Spanish. Those poor people probably still figuring out what the hell I said. <laughs> like, my Spanish consider, consisted of dame pistola, which means give me your gun, right? That's all I know. <laughs> so I thought I could speak Spanish, and those, I was the only English-speaking person in Rome, so I switched over in, uh, to English, and they still don't know what the hell I said. <laughs> At the end of the meeting, they came up and they hugged me. And I can tell who the old-timer was by the serenity in their face. And I can tell who the new guy was by the pain in their face. You know what? They may not have understood, but you know what? They understood. Language of the heart, you know? I love Alcoholics Anonymous. What's going on today? I, uh, I still work for the city of Philadelphia. I'm no longer a police officer. Uh, uh, so for those who have warrants, you can relax. <laughs> Take care of that stuff, though, fellas. We got computers, you know. Nothing goes away. And seriously, all kidding aside, as you get... Uh, when, when you turn yourself in, you get a little bit more credibility. You know, when we, when we pinch you on an auto stop and we take you in, you, you have no credibility. So take care of that stuff, you know. Uh, but uh, I was talking about the 12 step. 12 step where it takes many different forms and fashions, you know. Correct prisons, I did that a, few, a little bit, but, you know, it just wasn't for me. And that's not take a shot at that. That's important work. But there's, uh, there's public information, PI. There's CPC. That's not PCP. That's CPC. <laughs> Cooperation with professional community, taking uh, professional students to open AA meetings, such as divinity students, medical students. So for one day when they're practicing their profession, they may send a parishioner or a patient or a client to Alcoholics Anonymous. They have some sort of idea. You know, there's a telephone volunteers. Again, for those who have more time, you can get involved in the central office. You can get involved in the, uh, the area. I get uncomfortable when people say that's about politics. That has not been my experience. In fact, my experience has been those people involved in that level of service are some of the most selfless people I've ever met because I tell you, talk to, I don't know if there's any area offices here, but talk to them if you see them. I mean, I know there's a former delegate here, Dave, I was talking to him. That's a hell of a commitment. You're doing a lot of travel and then there's a, you give up a lot of sacrifice, you know, but, uh, but you can work behind the scenes, you know, uh, just working with a drunk one on one, you know, some of us, uh, you know, some of us are real good with checkbooks and there's some of us who should never, ever be allowed near a checkbook. <laughs> The deal is, you've got to find out what your gift is. It may be sitting... I'm a firm believer that every person in this room has a gift. It may be different than, than the person sitting next to you, but it's your gift. You need to find out what your gift is, you know? And it's, a, it's an incredible way of life. Uh, like I said, I still work for the city. I actually uh, wound up getting stabbed and uh, pretty severely hurt. I went back to grad school, and I got rehired by the city. I do some counseling for the union there. I... Uh, Never been married. I don't know how many kids. Came close a couple times. Uh, with the married, that is. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I got a pretty good life today. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, Christ, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I had no business being in that. For me, it was just tough to get out of a bar in Philadelphia, let alone Nashville, Tennessee. You know? One other thing I want to finish up with, because I alluded to a couple times. I kept saying that I was a mummer. I was a mummer. One of my favorite sayings in the big book says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. If the newcomer could see no joy in our existence, they wouldn't want it. And I know I kind of paraphrase that. I'll never be as eloquent as Bill, but you get the idea. If you're new and think that your life is over and you've got to wear the hair shirt and make these meetings for the rest of your life, man, you're greatly mistaken. Your life's not over, just starting. You know, whatever you did drunk, you could, be, you could do stone cold sober. You could be better at it. You could have more fun. And most of all, you could remember it. Yeah. Now, I'm a lifelong mummer. In fact, I'm a third-generation mummer. And what the mummer is, I know there's a bunch of people from Jersey here, too. They're from the Witness Protection Program. We rotate them every now and then. <laughs> Got to move them around. So, but the deal is, the mummers, it's a, it's a parade. That's right. It's a parade of New Year's Day. And what it is, it's... A, Got about 30,000 men. We let women in the parade now, but back then it was 30,000 men, makeup, sequins, and feathers. I've done a fifth step. I'm free. And we would dance in the middle of the street. We would dance in the middle of the street, and we spoof everyone. We are, far, we are definitely politically incorrect. If you're thin-skinned, God bless you. And uh, we spoof everyone, and it's a drunk fest. It is, it's like a, I told people it's like a combination of like the, the full money and the Mardi Gras. In fact, I personally think we make the Mardi Gras look like a bunch of Mormons. This is nuts. It's bitter cold. It's drinking. It, it's the longest continuous parade in the country. Now, the Mardi Gras is three days right before Lent, but this is the parade goes for about 12, 13 hours. Mummers is actually to, uh, derived from the Greek god of ridicule, who was Mummus. That's where, so a little antiquity there. That's where Mummers comes from. But it's a, it's a blast. I'm at a midnight meeting, and 
16 years ago. Midnight meetings are great meetings. Midnight meetings are either the most spiritual or the most bizarre, but there's no one between. I just love midnight meetings. <laughs> I'm at a midnight meeting. I tell my story. I'm a lifelong mom. A kid came up to me afterwards. He said, listen, would you be interested in marching the parade this year? I said, you're out of your mind. People placing the things. I got no business being there. He said, no, you don't understand. We're starting a sober group of mummers called the 12 Steppers. Now, sober mummer, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> so for this past New Year's Day, January 1st of 2006, was my 15th year up the street with the 12 Steppers. I'm the last of the original left. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was selected as captain of the brigade, which is a very high honor. <laughs> Back in the day for the drinking brigades, that captain always gets the beer truck. So, but I was there. They elected captain of the brigade. I just marched to my 37th parade. Here I am. I'm able to do something that was a very big uh, part of my family, my family's history. And here I am able to do it stone cold sober. Now I'm listening. If you can wear a satin dress or go out in Broad Street on New Year's Day sober, anything is possible. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if you're new, I wish you well. I don't wish you luck because luck ain't got nothing to do with it, you know? Get yourself a home group. Get yourself a sponsor. Make sure your sponsor's done the steps. If he hasn't done the steps, to be honest, he ain't got no business sponsoring you. You know, I always use the analogy because back home, everyone wants to get a union card. The building trades are strong back home. And sponsorship is like, uh, like the building trades. Let's say you become an iron worker. You're an apprentice, and for four years you go to school and you work under the, uh, the eye of a journeyman. Well, that's what recovery is. If you know, you're the apprentice and the sponsor is the journeyman. He takes you through the journey. You get your experience of the 12 steps. Then you become the journeyman and you take the apprentice under your wing, you know. And that's the best in that way I can describe that. But get yourself a sponsor. Make sure he's done the steps. Really little quick little trick, the way he finds out if you've done the steps or not. You can always ask him. You'll hear two things. Yes or no. Yes, that's your man. No, thank you very much and move on, you know. Get yourself a home group. Get involved. Start praying. Praying to something. Please don't pray to no light bulbs or doors on that crazy mess you hear. Uh, that ain't going to happen. Uh, this is a spiritual program, the higher power, or a home group, sponsorship, service. It's the whole bowl of wax. It's just not one part. It's the whole bowl of wax. And I really wish you well, and I thank you very much for the privilege, and it is a privilege to participate in an AA meeting. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.